The Autumn Wood Path. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autumn Wood Path from Where Town and Country Meet by James Buckham. LibriVox Coffee Break Collection Number 9. The woods are never so full of interest and fascination as when the first frosts have touched the leaves and purified the crisp nipping air and filled the forest with that expectant hush that follows the insect hum and bird music of summer then as one walks along the quiet wood path he experiences again something of the vanished child sense of fairyland the forest aisles are full of mystery the glint of sunshine in nearby glades and the flicker of falling golden leaves mingle like fact and fancy and in the hush and glimmer and beauty of the scene one expects to see anything from fairies dancing on the moss to princes and princesses riding suddenly across the path with plumes and jewels and jingling bridles an enchanted place is the october wood you wonder at the change that has come over it since the thrush and the vireo and the warbler packed their flutes and started slowly and silently southward strange how grateful it is to the ear sometimes not to hear the birds singing but it is because you have heard them singing all summer long that you can be pleased with october's silence the sweetest song needs silence after it to fill the measure of its delight but the autumn woods have the bird cries though not the bird songs you will not have walked far along the wood path before you are startled by that feathered alarmist the blue jay he hears you or rather divines you afar off and makes the woods ring with his hoarse scream of warning by and by you see him plunging from tree to tree in short scolding flights absurdly indignant that you should have invaded his privacy even so long after the nesting season is over his is the cry that you will oftenest hear in the woods from now until snow flies it is one of the audible accessories of an autumn walk and though the jay's voice is essentially harsh i have learned to love it because of its associations this bird has two distinct cries you could never call them songs either in quality or variety of sound one is the penetrating far-sounding raucous scream that he uses when doing self-imposed sentinel duty the other is a thin short metallic cry that sounds in the distance like the ringing of a small hammer on a blacksmith's anvil the latter sound is almost musical and with its associations soon grows to be inexpressibly pleasing to one who loves to ramble at all seasons of the year another autumn bird cry harsh in itself but softened by surroundings and associations is that of the crow a restless bird always but more than ever so when frosty weather has set in and pilgrimages both long and short are in order he labours over the woods on heavy wing cawing gruffly as he goes without apparent reason unless it be to express his troubled and dissatisfied state of mind perhaps he is thinking of the hard times ahead though heaven knows times are always hard enough for a hearty eater with such thievish and forbidden tastes as his no doubt his stomach is empty now and he knows not where nor how to fill it strangely enough the almost domesticated robin that has nested in the apple tree close to the house and cheered us all summer with its flute-like morning and evening song becomes in october one of the wildest and most suspicious of birds retiring to the deep woods and adding its sharp suspicious chirping cry to that of the blue jay and the crow i have seen whole flocks of robins in october miles within the heart of an upland forest where you scarcely ever find them during the spring and summer shy suspicious creatures they are now taking to wing with great swiftness and clamour before the rambler gets even within gun range of them as if he would care to shoot such plebeian game if he could 
but like bobolink who becomes the pot hunter's reed bird in winter robin seems to aspire to the dignity of becoming a game bird as soon as the shooting season opens doubtless quite ignorant of the fact that nearly all our northern states by a special law protect his russet body from destruction as the wood path climbs a dry sun-baked ridge we come to a succession of little round hollows shallow pits in the powdery loam where that genuine and royal game bird the ruffed grouse has lain like a roadside hen dusting itself in the sun a pretty sight it must have been the large greyish bird with its alert trim head and bright eyes always watchful tossing the dust with vigorous flirts of the wing far up over its back and nestling and shifting round and round in the warm hollow i have seen hundreds of such dusting holes in my rambles through the woods but only once have i beheld a ruffed grouse actually dusting itself as i have described it was at noon of a hot september day and i was lying in the shade beside the wood path when the cautious bird stole out for its midday bath it was a hen grouse trim in body and graceful and quick in every movement i lay motionless watching her for nearly fifteen minutes then a dog barked at the foot of the ridge and the grouse was gone in an instant leaving a few soft feathers swirling down into the dust how large a part of the life and interest of the woods centres in the birds every true nature lover speaks of them first and chiefly when describing his outdoor rambles yet there are other creatures and things that win the attention of a rambler by the autumn wood path he notes the nibbled shoots of birch and alder where the rabbit or hare has browsed them by the light of the moon for these little animals are both night feeders shy big-eyed and big-eared secretive and cautious as behoves such tender toothsome creatures the chosen prey of man and beast here where the path dips down beside the brook is a wet flat stone just abandoned by a muskrat i heard his splash as i drew near that was nibbling a wild parsnip it would be useless to look for his hole for it is well hidden under the bank beneath the surface of the water and slants upward to some dry grass-lined nest above the water-line a little farther along i catch a glimpse of the dark slim lithe body of an otter gliding rapidly over the stones to a deep pool in which he vanishes no doubt he has been fishing in his quiet patient way lying by the water's edge ready to pounce with claws and teeth upon any unwary trout or minnow that ventured too near it is curious how averse a fox is to wetting even the soles of his dainty feet i was walking along this same brook one october afternoon this time with gun in hand when a fox came trotting unsuspiciously down to the tip of a little point of land around which the brook bent like a silver triangle he looked up and saw me as i was creeping down towards the base of the triangle though still not quite within gun range the fox might easily have escaped me and saved his life by plunging through the shallow brook and up the opposite bank into a hemlock thicket but rather than wet his feet he turned and came scurrying back along the water's edge as far from me as he could get it was a fatal bit of squeamishness on his part for it brought the handsome fellow within range of my gun i have a rug of his skin under my desk now i would like to say a word about the flowers one may find even in october along the wood path and scattered over the upland pastures but already my chapter grows over long i may simply name a few of the blossoms i picked last fall between the first of october and the fifth of november fringed gentian purple aster golden rod blue toad flax fall dandelion canada violet spurge common yarrow white alder trumpet weed witch hazel moth mullein knotweed thorn apple and ladies tresses the autumn wood path 
if you follow it far enough up the hills comes to an end in a mountain pasture surrounded by a tumble-down rail fence and here we may fitly leave it swallowed up in brakes and raspberry bushes nobody now living knows where it originally ended perhaps at some old-time logging camp far up beneath the shadow of tarhouse's peak or perhaps it was part of an indian trail that never stopped until it had connected albany with the algonquin villages on lake champlain End of the Autumn Wood Path by James Buckham